So we are going to talk about quotient groups, conjugation, and why the idea of a normal subgroup is so important in group theory. Let's suppose we have a group G and a subgroup H of G. The first thing I'm going to note here is that if we look at the coset H times H for some element in that subgroup, notice that H is an element of this coset. And we also know, of course, that H is an element of the subgroup by definition. What that means is that H is in both of these cosets, which means they intersect. We know that cosets are disjoint. So the only way for these two cosets to intersect is if they are equal. And therefore, if H is in H, then that means that this coset is equal to the original subgroup. Given a subgroup H, we can construct cosets that look like AH by just multiplying on the left by some element of the group. The idea of a quotient group is that we want to turn these cosets into elements of some new group. The reason that we would want to do that is, for example, that AH times H, remember that H times H just gives us the original subgroup, is equal to AH. What this means is that if we have two group elements where the only difference between them is multiplying by an element of this subgroup, looking at the cosets instead of the individual elements allows us to ignore these kinds of differences. It lets us kind of factor out the idea of this subgroup H, which is one of the reasons that a quotient group is also called a factor group. And in fact, when we make a group out of these cosets, we write it as G mod H to show that we're factoring out the aspect of the group that comes from this subgroup H. Now, in order to have a group where the elements are these cosets, we need to have some way of multiplying the elements. So say we have two elements, AH and BH, in our group. What does it mean to multiply these? Well, one easy way that we can define this multiplication is to say that we just multiply the group elements out front. So we get AB times H. And this is a very nice way to define multiplication because it preserves equations from the original group. To see what that means, let's suppose that in the original group G, we have two elements, X and Y, that multiply to some element G. Now let's consider what happens if we multiply the cosets XH times YH. With this multiplication rule, we multiply the elements in the front, so this is going to be XYH. But because XY equals G, this is the same as GH. So we see that in the original group, if XY equals G, then XH times YH equals GH which makes this a very nice multiplication rule to work with. One way to describe this fact is that the map that sends A to the coset AH is a homomorphism when we define multiplication this way. Now this rule gives us some very nice results. First of all, we know that E times X equals X, where E is the identity in our group G. From this, we also know EH times xh equals xh, just substituting into this rule we derived earlier. And therefore we can see that eh doesn't affect x in this multiplication. This is the identity element in our new group. Next, we know that a inverse times a equals the identity, where a inverse is the inverse in the original group. From this, we see that a inverse h times ah equals EH, the identity element in our new coset group. Therefore, we see that every element has an inverse. And the last identity here is we know in a group that multiplication is associative. So AB times C is the same as A times BC. If we translate that to the cosets using this rule right here, then we get that AH in here, A times B turns into AH times BH, and then C becomes CH. This is equal to AH times BH and then CH. So we see that because multiplication is associative in the original group, it is also associative when we look at the coset group.
And so we have the identity, existence of inverses, and associativity. So it seems like we're done. And we've shown that with this multiplication rule, we have a group with these cosets. But there's one more thing we have to check. We showed that this set satisfies all of the group axioms, but we also have to ask, is this multiplication well defined? To see what that means, let's look at a specific example. Let's look at the dihedral group of order 2n. So these are the symmetries of an n-sided polygon. We're going to look at a specific subgroup, which I'll call S, and this is the subgroup generated by the element S, which is reflections. So this group just has two elements, which are the identity and the reflection element. And let's take a look at the group that we would get from D2n mod S. One of the cosets that we're going to have in this group is R times S. And if we have r times s, and we multiply it by itself. Using this multiplication rule, we're going to get r times r, which is r squared s. Now because s is an element of this subgroup, we know that r s times s is the same thing as this original coset. And so if we do any multiplication with this element, we should get the same result because it literally is the same set of elements. It's the same coset. So if we take rs and multiply it by rs times s, the result we're going to get is r squared s times s. And there are no problems here because we remember that this is just the same as r squared s. But let's look at what happens if we take rs s as the first thing in our product. If we do this multiplication out, we're going to get rsr times s. Now we know in the dihedral group, s times r is the same thing as r inverse times s. And so what we get here is r r inverse, which is just the identity, and s times s, which just gives us the original set. But now we have a bit of a problem because r squared is not in our subgroup, so r squared s is not equal to s we've multiplied the same elements and yet somehow got two different results. This is what it means for multiplication to not be well defined. When we're looking at this coset, we call the elements R and RS coset representatives. They're specific elements that we choose to represent an entire set. We see the problem with multiplication here is that sometimes if we choose different coset representatives for the same coset, we can get different results. It wasn't a big deal when we chose a different representative for the second element in the product because the S just gets absorbed into the subgroup anyway. But if we choose a different representative for the first factor, it can cause us some problems. In order for multiplication to be well-defined, we have to make sure that picking a different coset representative for the first factor doesn't change the product that we get. So let's say we have a coset xh, and this is equal to another coset x prime h. So x and x prime are two different coset representatives for the same coset. For multiplication to be well defined, we need to have that x prime h times yh is equal to xh times yh. Now, if we use the multiplication rule that we have up here, that means that we need x prime y h to equal x y h. So let's say we have these two cosets, x h and x prime h. One thing we know is that because the identity is in every subgroup, x prime is always going to be an element of x prime h. Because x prime h is equal to x h, that means that we have x prime being an element of xh. And in order for this to be true, we must have x prime equal to xh for some h in the subgroup, because these are what the elements of this coset look like. We can substitute that into the equation down here. We're going to get xhy times h is equal to xy times h. Now we can multiply by x inverse on the left, both sides here, and we'll get hy times h 
equals y times h. And finally, we can multiply by y inverse on the left, both sides. And we get y inverse h y h is equal to that original subgroup h. And like we saw up here, y inverse h y is an element of this coset. So if these two are equal, we must have y inverse h y in this subgroup h over here. And in this process, we could have chosen any x, x prime, and y that we want, which means we also could have gotten any h that we want. So this statement needs to be true for every y in the group and every h in the subgroup. If we satisfy that condition, then our multiplication will be well defined. Now to make this look more like what you would see in a textbook, I'm going to say let g equal y inverse. Then the condition becomes that for every g in the group, we must have g h g inverse being in h. This process where we go from h to g h g inverse, that is called conjugation of h by g. So in order to have our multiplication be well defined, we need to have that for every element in the subgroup, if we conjugate it by an element of the group, we stay in the subgroup. If this condition is satisfied, we can follow that reasoning that we did before all the way back up to show that multiplication is defined for every single pair of elements in the group. So we just showed that the quotient group g mod h has well-defined multiplication if and only if for every element in the group and every element of the subgroup, this condition is satisfied. Because this is related to whether a subgroup can create a quotient group, it's important enough that we give it its own name. When this condition is satisfied, we say that H is a normal subgroup of G, and we write it like this with the triangle pointing towards the subgroup. Now let's go through some examples of determining whether a subgroup is normal. We can start with the thing that we saw before, which is the dihedral group with the subgroup with the identity and the reflection element. In that case, we know that multiplication isn't well defined because we saw a problem with that earlier, which means that this is not going to be a normal subgroup. To show that this subgroup is not normal, we need to find some element G in the larger group and some element S in our set here, such that G S G inverse is not in this subgroup S. Now, if we pick the identity element, then conjugation is just going to give us the identity back. So that's not really going to help us here, which leaves S as the element we're going to try to conjugate. Now, let's say we choose the single rotation R in D2N and S in our subgroup. If we do this conjugation, it's going to look like R S R inverse. Now we know that SR inverse is equal to R times S. So we get R squared S, which we know is not an element in the subgroup. So we started with S in our subgroup, and we conjugated by R to get something that's not in S, which means that S is not a normal subgroup of the dihedral group. Now let's look at a different subgroup, this time the subgroup generated by the single rotation element. We want to see if that is a normal subgroup in the dihedral group. We need to check this conjugation condition right here for some element in the dihedral group and some R in this subgroup. Now we know that if we conjugate by an element in the subgroup, of course R, R, R inverse, that's going to stay in the subgroup because it's closed under multiplication. So let's take an element outside of the subgroup. So say we take S in the dihedral group. Then this conjugation is going to look like S times R to the K times S inverse, where R to the K is some element in this subgroup here. Now we know that we can write S R to the K as R to the negative K times S. Right here we have S S inverse, that's going to cancel out and we're left with r to the negative k. And we know that that is in the subgroup generated by a rotation element, which means that when we conjugate by s, we stay inside the subgroup. 
And using this fact, we can show that for every single element in the dihedral group, if we conjugate r to the k by that element, we're going to stay in the subgroup, which means that in fact r is a normal subgroup of d to n. So that is how we define a normal subgroup. We use this conjugation condition to check whether a subgroup is normal. And we know that if and only if this subgroup is normal, we're able to construct a quotient group out of the cosets of that subgroup such that multiplication is well defined.